Uh, can everyone hear me? I just never know with these things because uh, I didn't go to the school of Janet Jackson of performing. I just, hello, 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 can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay, because I, I definitely don't like shouting, um, but um, I just want to make sure that everyone hears me. So, that being said, um, thank you very much. Um, and, um, yeah, I feel great to be here. Um, let's, uh, let's sort of uh, get things going like uh, I try to do every day. And uh, every day I like to greet the Dom. So I say, good morning, Dom. Um, for the few of you, I'd say one or two who might follow me on Twitter, this is something that I, I like to do ritually uh, just for kicks. And I've just kept, kept it going for a couple of years. But that being said, since I'm in uh, Norway, I thought I'd say this instead. Th that's, that's good morning, yeah? Good, because uh, that's what uh, Google Translate told me. Anyhow, I mean, also, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a, a quick couple of stories, but I was definitely delighted to come down here. And um, one of the first things I, I wanted to do, and I unfortunately forgot, but I, I wanted to go to uh, this address right here. I don't know if you can see at the top of what it says. Um, it might be wrong, I don't know. But um, I remember uh, in my head, I was like, okay, I got to make sure that I go down to this address right here, which is, I guess, uh, Waldemar something something gate. Now, does anyone know what, what was here? Okay, a few of you. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to sort of uh, not spoil it for you two. But either way, um, I was super excited to go here because um, this is where the Presto uh, rendering engine was, uh, was uh, conceived. Uh, for the few of you who definitely know, uh, essentially rendering engines are the very heart of, uh, of browsers that we use uh, every day. And not only was Presto done there, but KHTML was done there uh, as well. So uh, out of the few rendering engines that are out there uh, in the world, two of them were created in Oslo, and I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And I really want to go there and take a picture and, and brag to my friends. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get a chance. But like I said, Presto is the reason uh, Opera came about, and HTML, believe it or not, is the reason WebKit uh, came about, uh, which is the rendering engine for Safari. And if you think about it, uh, Blink was actually forked from WebKit. So uh, HTML is actually respons responsible for a lot of, uh, of the browsing that has taken place uh, out here on the planet. So that being said, um, I thought I would call Oslo now. Every time I, I'm going to write Oslo down, I'm going to write it like this. Uh, because I just thought it would be way too fitting for, for, for something like that uh, to not be done. That being said, my name is Henri. Uh, my last name is not Helvetica. That just happens to be my Twitter handle. But uh, a lot of people thought it was so cool that they would always ask me if it was my real name, and I say it's not. Uh, uh, I came from the arts, so it was only natural for me to use something. Uh, it's a known plume, ultimately. I am from the city of Toronto, a uh, city that I love dearly. It's beautiful. It's one of the biggest cities in North America, um, very diverse. Um, I'm a freelance developer there. I do a lot of consulting. Uh, I work in the community. I run some meetups, et cetera, et cetera, specifically uh, the performance meetup. And I just recently started the Jamstack one just out of interest. But one of the things that I do do in Toronto is uh, I actually uh, run. So uh, this is a very sweaty picture of me running. Um, well, after a run, anyhow. And uh, I actually post some of my runs now on Twitter because, and I use the hashtag um, devs who run because I'm actually trying to get developers to, get, to be a little bit more active. Uh, that being said, uh, it leads into one of the reasons why, again, I was excited to be in Oslo. And the reason being is uh, there, are a lot of some, there are some great athletes uh, coming out of here, and uh, out of Norway anyways. And one of them is this gentleman right here. Mr. Uh, Warholm, uh, he's actually the number one 400-meter hurdler in uh, the world right now, uh, which is kind of wild. And uh, following up with that, we also have uh, this trio of brothers. Is, is anyone familiar with these, these gentlemen? So on the left, we have Henrik. On the right, we have Philip. And in the middle, we have, uh, I'm going to call him the child prodigy. He's not even 20 yet, but very decorated uh, track athlete. Uh, runs the 5,000, maybe the 10,000. Runs the mile as well. But uh, I thought it was wild that they're, they're out here. And I had a dream that I'd go on a run with these guys. But it's not going to happen, unfortunately. But what is going to happen is that we're going to be um, having a conversation. And once again, 
Mobile Era, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for uh, bestowing the honor of, of having a bit of a keynote uh, with um, the, the audience here. And um, I'm going to jump right into it. And I'm going to come out in, with this statement right here, which is, the web is in a great place. And now, um, you know, some might say it's a contentious statement, and I won't disagree, but uh, we're going to basically dig into this uh, a little deeper. And before we, get the, uh, before we do that, let's dig into it a little deeper. Now, do you realize the internet turned 50? I think the anniversary was sometime last week. Um, you know, the first message was sent uh, ultimately uh, 50 years ago uh, on what was called back then the ARPANET. Now, um, Tim Berners-Lee put out a tweet about it, obviously on the same date, and obviously congratulating um, the people involved and uh, the actual moment in time, but also shared the fact that there were some, um, some moments uh, that he wanted to, to revisit, but that's a, a definitely a different story. But what we are going to talk about is the web, and the web is 30, 30 years. Now, I don't know if you remember what you were doing three years ago. Um, I vaguely remember what I was doing three years ago, but if you start to look at what you know, what people were doing 30 years ago, well, we'll start with this. Taylor Swift was born 30 years ago. Um, the Simpsons started 30 years ago. Do you know that uh, 30 years ago, um, skateboarding was legal in Norway because it was actually banned for a while because people were getting uh, injured left and right. So um, the decriminalized skateboarding. But Another interesting photo is this one right here. You might see a young Steve Jobs, and he's sitting by the next computer. And why did I post this photo? Well, um, some of you may realize that uh, the web actually started on a next computer. This is what Tim Berners-Lee was using at CERN, and this was Steve Jobs' company at the time. So if you really think about it, Steve Jobs had his hand in the creation of the web. What was I doing 30 years ago? I was staring in uh, stores looking at devices like these. Does anyone recognize what this is? A few of you? Okay, all right. Um, I mean, I loved the idea of getting on the net and I was staring at these modems and I knew one day I would take it home. And eventually I did. And what's the first thing I did when I got it? I went to news groups. News groups were the original sort of like social media site. They were just a message board where you made friends with people you didn't know from around the world. Like, that's how long ago it was. And I was also doing things like this, using AltaVista as my search engine. Even though Google's around, but I thought AltaVista was so cool that I'd gotten used to it, so I kept using it. And I was also using Netscape Navigator as a browser. Uh, I was a big fan of Netscape. It was one of the first browsers I came across, and I kind of stuck to it loyally. And I loved it so much, I made it my avatar. So if you ever find this avatar on Twitter, that is absolutely me. And whether it be Twitter, GitHub, wherever. Like, if you see that, that's, uh, that's your man. Now, in a more interesting moment, do you know that I can still run Netscape on my computer right now? This is a shot from yesterday. Now, this is uh, CNN Lite, so it's very sparse in terms of, uh, this, it's not very dynamic, but you'll see that is uh, November uh, 7th, 2019, and today's, oh, the recent news anyways. I just wanted to throw that in. But let's get back to the software that was the browser. And um, this is statement right here. The software is, this software is going to change everything. That was by Mark Andreessen, who was the lead on, um, Mosaic come Netscape. And I thought to myself, like, is this really going to change everything? You know what? He might be onto something. But here's another statement that I liked a lot. This one which um, said, things started exploding with the invention of the browser because suddenly the internet was accessible to the average person. That was by Kim Polisi. Uh, she just happened to be a PM on this uh, project that was called Java at the time. So people knew that something was going on with the uh, browser, something was, was going on on the web. What was going on? Well, 65 million users in 18 months. That's the adoption rate that had taken place. This was something that had never been seen. Even Microsoft in their heyday were blushing at these kind of numbers. Now, in today's speak, we have 4.5 billion people on the web right now. That's just over half the population. Now, you might think to yourself, like, okay, that's kind of a big number. Like, what happened? Like, a lot of people are getting on the net. Yeah, we get it. But there have been some weird sort of successes along the time that no one could explain, like Velcro. 
people are like, what the hell? Velcro is just like this and some hooks, like Viagra. What the hell? We know what that's all about. But this is what happened. No one, could ex no one predicted that something as small as a device like the smartphone would, be, uh, would have its hand in the explosion of the web and the adoption. And here's a photo that I like to post quite often. For those who don't know, this is a member of the Amish community. Um, They're known to basically shy away from all things technology, but the penetration of the smartphone was such that they even put their hands on this device. And another photo that I like to use is this one right here. Why do I like to use this? Well, I think it's emblematic of the penetration, once again, of the smartphone or maybe even feature phone. You're talking about territories that have limited connectivity, potentially limited access to power, but somehow they're on a smart device. So that being said, what do we do with these devices? You know, they're in our hands, they're in our pockets, we have them all the time. Well, we could pretty much do everything, starting with finding a date. You know, you can go to Tinder, find a date. Well, that's what people do on Tinder, apparently. You can take your Tinder date and buy a ticket to go to the opera, right? Because that's what you do with a Tinder date. And after the Tinder date, you go to the restaurant and you can have some crump cakes. Is that something that's, that's something that's consumed here, yes? Crump cakes, something like that? That's what I heard. They look pretty awesome anyways. But nonetheless, um, this is just scratching the surface. You know I mean, this, uh, the, smart device, the smartphone, the feature phone, the web has allowed us to do a lot of things. So uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this presentation. It's called The Shape of the Web, and it's a bit of a conversation that I'm having about the future of the employed technologies and also the technologists that are employed. So, shall we? Um, so, I like to talk about things like collaborations. I feel like the collaboration is going to be the base of the future of the web. And why do I say this? Well, we have front-end developers. We have back-end developers. We have designers, we have user experience professionals, we have author experience professionals, something that I came across uh, very recently at a conference. Um, but at the end of the day, the amalgam of all of them creates an amazing developer experience. And when the developer experience is amazing, it trickles down right down to the user. And the user experience is going to be great as well. In fact, it's going to be delightful, it's going to be delectable, it's actually going to be what I like to call around my way, dope. Now, does anyone remember a language called dope? Show of hand? Yeah, I didn't think so. It was actually a failed language, and it stood for Dartmouth Oversimplified Programming Experiment. Um, it was the brainchild of this gentleman right here, John Kemeny. He was a Dartmouth professor at mathematics, and he believed that he could get non-STEM students to program. So he got together some CS students, some non-STEM students, and got them to work together and try and create this language. Now, he didn't let the failure in DOPE sort of stop them, and they kept plugging away, kept plugging away. And eventually, they came up with something else. What that was, was this right here, BASIC. Who remembers BASIC by show of hand? Okay, amazing. As you know, BASIC was a starting point, a launch point for a lot of people in, in, in programming. And in fact, it was seen as um, what some might call uh, an aligned team. And that was actually his daughter who said that. But what I'm trying to say is the collaborative nature of the project is what produced BASIC. And we know what happened after that. Open source. Open source is basically a collaboration, ultimately. Let's talk about a company that deals in open source excessively, like Firefox. Um, this act of human collaboration across an open platform is essential to the individual growth and collective future. I'm going to say that again. Essential to the individual growth and collective future. No words truer. Now, you talk about some of the work that they do. Uh, 12,000 contributors, almost 750,000 contributions. Only 65,000 of them were code. The rest, user experience people, maybe author experience people. Once again, the collaborative nature of the project is creating 
a great product. Another thing that I like to talk about is respect. And the respect for specifically developers. Let's talk about respect for developers. Doing things like having proper documentation. Who's had bad documentation in their time and just, just got annoyed? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, the people who have great documentation, believe me, the users come out and ch ch uh, chime in about it. They want to let the world know how awesome it is to work on this project because the documenta documentation they've been using has been amazing. Here's an example here uh, with Gatsby. And Gatsby has gone out quite often and said, like, you know what, we've put in a lot of work on our docs, and they like to see things like this happen. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example. I'm speaking at Angular Atlanta uh, later on this year. Now, can anyone tell me when the conference is taking place? Anyone know? OK. <laughs> yeah, it will be, apparently. Um, but the point is, you have challenges like what just happened right there. And uh, this uh, a statement that I like right here as well from Andre Sitnik. The main problem is when the whole interface doesn't work very well with your culture. These are things that are taking place right now. And it's, gonna, it's all going to kind of come back together. That's why we have moments like these, these acronyms. Uh, specifically, this is what it means. Internationalization. Because, imagine toi que tu as des documents et tu ne sais pas quoi faire avec. Tu es là, tu es en train de tout lire et puis tu te lances les mains en l'air parce que tu ne sais pas quoi faire. Now, who understood what I just said right there? Yeah, a couple of you. I figured as much. But the rest of you, I might as well have read lip, you know what I mean, like Mandarin. The point is, documentation, internationalization, that's having respect for the audience that is out there. And specifically, a statement like this from Microsoft, with a growing software market far beyond the English speaking language, uh, speaking world, pardon me, it's important for the software to support various texts and data formats to reach all the potential customers. To reach all the potential customers. So some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with West Boss. Um, shortly before, actually, I, I'd written this talk, um, he had tweeted this out. He talked about you know, being amazed with the amount of people from Nigeria that were hitting us, his site up for his courses. And he actually then went ahead and shared some additional data of some of the, the traffic he was getting. Now, if you look at these top, say, 26, 27, you can count on one hand probably in the English-speaking countries. This is what I'm talking about, because I'm going to come back to this photo once again. The developers in these territories are trying to create the products. So we have the users of the products in these territories, ideally in their native tongues. Now, let's look at some quick data here. This is a list of the top 10 um, uh, territories with the most internet users. OK, I see the USA in there. I see BRIC. There's not a lot of English in there. Let's look at uh, the one with the greatest growth, top 10 once again. The great, if, if, when you have the interest in the documentation, the interest in the product, you're probably going to get also as much interest from these developers in these territories. And once again, it's about trying to um, cater to their needs. One company that is catering to their needs is GitHub right here. They essentially translated their documentation to Spanish. In America, there are quite a bit uh, of Spanish-speaking uh, residents. And I know their DevRel, he just actually spent about two weeks in South America. They are expanding. They are going out. They are reaching their audience in their native tongues. That's having respect for the developers. Let's talk about developer diversity. I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We know what that's all about. I mean, I'm going to touch on something very quickly, like women in technology. It's not about um, sort of like questioning their acumen when they come out with product, with releasing product. Now, um, since I'm in Scandinavia, I want to talk about Lena real quickly, because I, I do tend to work in the web performance space. Um, and the quick story is this. 
you know, this is the photo that has been used for years and years and years uh, for signal processing, compression, any kind of examples you want to uh, bring up in, in image manipulation. Um, some of you may or may not know, but this is a photo that came from Playboy in the early 70s. And people are still using it to this day. I don't believe that's having respect for the developers that you work with. Let's talk about cultural diversity. Yesterday I spoke to two volunteers, one from Poland, one from Pakistan. They're here in Norway volunteering at a English-speaking conference. Like, connect the dots right there. They're on the committee, they're helping out. This is the cultural diversity that is going to help companies thrive. Let's talk about language diversity. And my favorite battle, ooh, CSS versus JavaScript. I don't know how that started. I really don't, actually. But it's ironic that I would bring this up in Oslo. Why? Because we have Hokumbun Lee here, the father of CSS. And here's what he had to say about the importance of CSS. CSS, I think, was a necessary part of the web because designers came to the web. Let me hit you with another quote that I thought was just as powerful. Um, this one right here is from Rachel Andrews. CSS is too trivial for real developers to worry about, yet too difficult for them to understand. And it's absolutely true. You hear sometimes these Fans of JavaScript come out and say, oh yeah, CSS, no big deal, it's all gravy. I bet you you could leave them in a room for 15 minutes and they would not be able to center a div. But CSS is easy, apparently. I like to talk about user experience because at the end of the day, we are user experience merchants, certainly. We want to make sure that the product is um, as friendly as possible. And that's why we're going to use the technology. We're going to spend two days talking about technology, ideally to improve that user experience. Something that we absolutely love is making sure things are fast. Oh, I don't like fast sites. Said no one. In fact, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of people are using uh, Lighthouse now. Hands up if you're using Lighthouse. I mean, don't, don't feel bad if you're not. It's all gravy. Lighthouse is a, an auditing tool, and a lot of people have been using lately to um, check the performance speed of their page. And it, it's good, because sometimes getting people to pay attention to performance is not the easiest. But did you know the medium Lighthouse score is 41? So basically, the web, is, uh, the web has a failing grade, which is actually kind of shocking. But there's a lot of work to do. And that is part of the future of the web, making sure that things, uh, the user experience is as clean as possible. Let's talk about um, Ali right here, AKA accessibility. Why is accessibility important? Well, you wanna make sure that you don't sort of like leave a faction of the society behind. Um, let me tell you a quick story. Um, I feel like I'm an able-bodied person. I don't have really cognitive challenges. Uh, my eyesight's great. But I'll be the first one to tell you I'm an assistive technology user. Why? Because I can. I like to take my iPad, um, read the latest blog posts, read the latest news, and turn on screen readers, put it on the, uh, on the counter, and clean the kitchen. But I'll tell you right now, I know there are a lot of sites out there that are just not that gangster because the accessibility, the tab order is all messed. You know, the, the, there's no uh, 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 alt tags. I have to listen to the succession of numbers for like two minutes and come back and it's still going on. Accessibility is important. Accessibility is the future of the web. And, you know, it'd be hard to not talk about the future without mentioning things like privacy. And I realized privacy is super important. And in fact, I remember uh, a politician recently in the US um, described privacy as uh, the dark psychic forces. 
But, you know, I'll go ahead and tell you that I feel like privacy is an issue because the web has actually been pretty successful. If the web didn't have the penetration that it had, I think privacy would not be an issue. Because why do you need privacy if nothing's going on? The web is cracking. The future of the web will be also dealing with privacy. Now, this is super near and dear to me, community. Community is so important. And in fact, um, in a conversation I had yesterday at the dinner as well, um, someone came out and said um, they basically got a job that they never applied for, never asked for, but it was all due to community. What happened? Well, you know how these things go. You get introduced to someone. It's like, hey, how you doing? Whatever. What do you do? Okay, cool. And then the next conversation is, uh, hey, let's go for coffee. And we know where that usually leads. But the bottom line is they ended up having a conversation. And I'm going to say um, an interview and a half later, she got a job offer. And when we were talking about it, she essentially thanked community. Because she was involved in community. She met a few people. Um, her work was being recognized and helped her get a job. This is why I'm going to use a, a quote from a gentleman by the name of Jason Lengstroff, who's out over at, um, he left Gatsby. He's over at Netlify right now. Community as a primary metric. When I heard that, I was just like, oh my god, how did I not come up with this myself? Because I thought it was such a fantastic quote, such a, a poignant statement. It was basically a bullseye. Because if you think about it, if you have a response from the community, you have engagement from the community, that is the metric you want to use. Um, you have some great framework adoption, you know, view. Things are cracking, the docs are great, and people are loving it, and you know, the numbers are out there. A lot of people using your framework, that is the community speaking, that is community as a primary metric. People are going around sometimes now that they have great scores on Lighthouse. Oh man, my accessibility is amazing, my speed is amazing, and they're out there tweeting about it. I see it all the time. That's your work, getting out, that's the community speaking, that's the community being used as a primary metric. And I think that's fantastic. Now, let's get back to the web. I mean, are we in a good place? I personally think so. So many things are possible. We are here under the roof of, I don't even know the name of this building, I'm so sorry. But we are here as practitioners united in one cause, a, to learn, B, to be together as a community. I think the web is in a fantastic place. Um, I mean, the idea that my dad can sit there and sort of like FaceTime me and to tell me that he was able to update his insurance on the internet, and he thinks that's fantastic. He's like, man, how is that possible? I'm like, bro, it's... It's, it's the web, man. It's like there's so much things happening. He loves it. Um, I mean, think about some of the, you know, some of the conferences you've been to. You, you run into some of the DevRels who have so many things to talk about, so much information to share with you. That's the web at work. Um, I didn't mention this, but I mean, I have a, a bit of a history in music. And uh, I once discussed on how uh, I was able to, oh, I don't want to sit there and, you know, date myself, but I was holding a CD up to the camera, and uh, it was uh, a promotion that was taking place, and this is years ago, and, uh, you know, turn the camera on, show the CD, and this folder magically appeared on my desktop with brand new music, and I was losing my mind. I thought this was awesome, but that is the web at work. And I think that's so fantastic. It's almost voodoo, actually. But nonetheless, we're going to spend the next couple of days sort of like watching people experiment, tell us about you know, improvements in user experience, show us new ways on, on how to sort of like 
work with users and, like I said, improve their user experience. And I think that's fantastic. So that being said, I think we're going to spend two amazing days making new discoveries. Oh, what I like to say is delight in discoveries. And I hope that uh, you enjoy them. And with that being said, I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, you could always catch me on Twitter if you have any comments about uh, anything or my second presentation later on today. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to speaking to uh, everyone here. Thank you very much. Ooh, 30 minutes on the dot. <laughs>